And I think it's important to recognise that very quickly after the budget, this was something that was clearly raised through your membership. It came through your leadership. Uh, John came to me and said, we have a problem here, Simon. I'd like it resolved. Uh, we've looked at the numbers and obviously it changes the amount of savings that we can make. But that is a commitment that we are, that I said I would, uh, um, that I would give and we'll follow through on that. Um, so that was the downside of the budget. The upside of the budget right, is about trying to do strategic things with money that we have to spend. <coughs> about making savings so that we can find money to do strategic things in agriculture. And what we're doing in relation to the beef sector, in my view, is very significant. We've seen the benefit of uh, uh, dairy discussion groups uh, to try and upskill dairy farmers. We have nearly 7,000 dairy farmers now meeting on a monthly basis, talking to each other, challenging each other on what works, what doesn't work, talking to each other about how to make uh, their herds more um, efficient, more profitable, talking about things like food conver uh, feed conversion efficiency, yield per cow, um, managing stock, managing quota, which is a big issue, and I'm sure you'll have questions on that in relation to soft landing later on. Uh, all of those things, where when, when farmers meet and discuss, they find better ways of doing things, better ways of becoming more profitable, more efficient, uh, better ways of running their farm. Uh, and we need to now replicate that model in the beef sector. I hope nobody will take offence when I say that the difference between the most efficient 5% of, of beef farmers in Ireland and you know, the less efficient beef farmers is absolutely massive in terms of income potential, profitability, efficiency um, and so on. And we must close that gap. Uh, and the IFA, in my view, has an obligation to help me try and do that along with Chagas, along with Borbia, um, uh, along with the other agents of the state that can help us on that. Uh, and so we have found 5 million euros to set up beef discussion groups. We're going to try and link, it, link that in with the Better Farm programme, which is already working quite well through the Farmers' Journal uh, um, and other bodies. Um, and, you know, let's face it, this is a bigger challenge than the dairy side. There's only 17,000 dairy farmers, there's about 85,000 beef farmers. So, we need to try and get people meeting, talking, uh, challenged by, uh, by people who will um, offer new ways and potentially better ways of doing things. Um, and we need people who will open up their minds to better ways of doing things. Uh, so we need to, in other words, modernize farming in Ireland so that we can get more from the natural resources that we have, which is predominantly a grass-based system to produce beef, milk, sheep, whatever we're producing, grain, uh, and so on. Um, so, the Beef Discussion Groups one is something that I hope you'll buy into. Um, um, there's a generous package in place to encourage farmers to actually participate in that. In terms of taxation, there were essentially three things that I really wanted to do um, in this budget. And I spoke to Michael Noonan months in advance of the budget to try and get a specific tax, tax treatment around certain strategic thinking for farming. Um, we have a number of restrictions essentially in terms of, of where we want to go uh, around you know, producing more food, becoming more profitable and so on. Uh, one of them is land mobility. Uh, many of you will have heard me say um, repeatedly, the average field in Ireland is sold once every 400 years. Once every 400 years. The average field in France is sold once every 70. And that is because of, of a historic um, attachment and linkage with the land that Irish people, Irish families and Irish farmers have. Most of the time farms stay within families and they roll over generation after generation. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we want to value it and we want to value family farms because that's the very heartbeat of rural Ireland. Um, but at the same time, we do want to make it possible if people want to sell their farm, if they want to get out of farming for whatever reason, that they can actually do that and that somebody can buy that land without it being a very costly or difficult process to do that. And that is why Michael Noonan has agreed to reduce the stamp duty from 6% to 1% uh, um, uh, for, for all transactions, uh, including farmland, and, uh, um, sorry, 
2% uh, of uh, uh, stamp duty on farmland, uh, but one, down to 1% when it's a transaction between relatives. Um, so we're going to try and encourage more land mobility in that regard. Uh, we're also trying to encourage farm partnerships. I know, I know this, there are some people in this room who are probably already in partnerships. But for most people in this room, the idea that you would farm collectively with a neighbour uh, or, or a, a, another farmer in the parish is a kind of an alien concept. Um, but in other countries this is the norm. Now we have a challenge. If we're serious about maintaining family farm ownership for food production, and I am absolutely committed to that, well then how do we get economies of scale into Irish farming to allow us to become more efficient at what we do, to allow us to produce high quality food at lower cost so that you can make more profits and more margins on what you sell? How do we do that? Well one of the ways in which we can do it is actually to start looking at collectively farming together where two or three or four or six farmers decide, well, we could all make more money if we actually pooled together and farmed as a business together, whereby potentially dairy farmers would link with beef farmers, where male calves would go into the beef section, um, where female calves may go into replacements, uh, and so on. We may link uh, arable farms with, um, uh, with pig farms in terms of slurry management, having a place to, uh, um, to, to store that slurry, uh, to spread it and so on. Where, where groups of farmers will have economies of scale in terms of what they purchase, in terms of how they use machinery, um, in terms of sharing facilities like dairy parlours and grazing paddocks, uh, having uh, economies of scale in terms of selling their produce, being able to bargain for, for better prices with meat factories or uh, a dairy cooperatives or whatever, depending on the standards that you're setting. Where farmers farming collectively will challenge each, each other and learn from each other in terms of better ways of doing things. And all of the evidence suggests that in other countries, and we've looked at partnership models in other countries, that, that it is a game-game relationship most of the time if they're properly set up and properly managed. But we also have to ensure that we have a system in place that can allow people to get out of partnerships if they're not working. Um, because we don't want um, land wars caught up in partnership models that have legal protection either. So I've asked Chagas to, um, to put in place uh, partnership pilot programs so that farmers can see in a practical way how they work in terms of different scenarios and so on. Um, and we've put a, um, a stock relief incentive in place for people to look at that option. Um, and the final strategic area that we wanted to address was generational change. You know, you'll hear organizations like MACRA, for example, reeling out the figures all the time. 7% of farmers in Ireland are under the age of 35. More than 25% of farmers are over the age of 65. Now, many of you will have sons and daughters who want to take over your farms. Um, uh, they, they will be highly educated and highly motivated by the time uh, they're ready to do that. Uh, we want to be able to ensure that there is a cost-effective transition from one generation to the next so that we can allow the ambition of the 27% increase in young people who are doing agricultural science, food science, or going to agricultural colleges this year, that they can realize their ambition and their potential on the land. And that they can put into practice what they've learned in terms of modern farming and its potential in Ireland. So, even though we made cuts, which I know I've been criticised for, and I know some of you aren't happy about, particularly around REX, um, we've also done some strategic things that I think are about modernising, are about driving efficiency within farms, and about realising the extraordinary potential that is there in the Food Harvest 2020 document for people. And at the same time, I think we have protected vulnerable farmers who are not in a position to be able to take advantage of the marketplace in the same way that others are. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is around trying to protect the rate and the area that you can apply for under, under disadvantage schemes and so on. Uh, and in relation to AOS, because people will, will ask me about whether there's going to be a new AOS scheme in place. And like, let me be honest with you about this. Right? I don't have the answer that you want. Uh, what I've said is that I will look at a limited AOS 3 scheme um, which will be primarily focused on people who are farming in special areas of conservation 
because I think that people who are farming in, in those areas, the restrictions that they have to farm under, does need financial recognition. And that is why if there is an AOS 3 scheme, if we can afford to do it and we'll have to find savings elsewhere, further savings elsewhere to pay for it, uh, well then it will be primarily focused on those SAC areas, which won't keep everybody happy, but it's important that I'm up front with you about what's possible and, and what isn't possible early on in the year, rather than raising expectations about anything um, uh, broader or more expensive than that. In relation to the Common Agricultural Policy, I had a, I had a long meeting with the Commissioner this morning. Uh, I know you had a long session with him as well. Um, <coughs> I think he's, um, uh, he's someone that has a very difficult job. Uh, I think he's done some things very, very well so far. Um, the first challenge that he had to do was to actually get agreement in the Commission to maintain the CAP budget um, in actual terms. Uh, and he did manage to do that. And a lot of people sort of take that for granted. Believe me, I've been involved in European politics for a long time. There are a lot of countries who would have liked to have seen a 20, 30, 40 percent cut to the CAP budget in actual terms. Uh, and so the starting point in terms of the budget as regards the Commission proposal uh, is a reasonable one. I wouldn't overplay it, but it's a reasonable one in terms of the maintenance of the actual overall financial envelope that's there for the CAP. And we need to be absolutely adamant that we will protect that. Because there is still a lot of pressure in the European Union, given all of the other financial and economic pressures that are there at the moment, there's still a lot of pressure coming on him and on the Commission to reduce the CAP budget and to shift that money into, into other sectors. And we will and are resisting that pressure. Um, in terms of, of how that money is spent, and I'm not sure, um, I didn't want to be sitting in the crowd and sort of looking over his shoulder when you were asking him questions, so I'm not quite sure what, he, uh, what you asked him and how he answered the questions, but let me just give you my take on what the, the real challenges are for us. Um, one, of, one of the successes we've had so far is, is around the, the conversation on how do you redistribute money between member states. Because the last time there was a CAP, all of the newer member states weren't even in the European Union. And so there is a huge discrepancy between countries that are doing well out of the CAP and countries that are not doing so well. And so as part of the proposal, there needs to be a redistribution from countries that are doing really well towards countries that are doing really poorly on average so that everybody moves towards the centre. And um, Ireland worked really hard to try and get the Commission to accept a, a method of measuring how well countries are doing that would actually suit Ireland, but that would also be fair. And we came up with what's called the pragmatic method, which is essentially to divide the, the single farm payment money that comes into a country by the eligible hectareage that is in that country. And if you use that method, which the Commission are using, well then Ireland is bang on the average. So in other words, regardless of how significant the redistribution is from the countries that have done well and have had payments above the average to countries that are not doing not so well, predominantly newer member states, because we're on the average, any redistribution doesn't really affect us. And again, that is something that some people are taking for granted, but believe me, that was hard won. Okay, so that's a, that's a minor victory for us that we should just pocket, forget about now and concentrate on the new challenges. Um, the biggest issue for us, let there be no mistake about this, there are issues around reference years, there are issues around greening, but the big issue for us is about whether or not Ireland will have flexibility, whether or not my department will have the flexibility to decide how best to spend direct payments uh, uh, in Ireland. In other words, how do we distribute that money amongst the farming population of Ireland to the maximum benefit of our industry and your livelihoods. And at the moment, the proposal coming from the Commission, which is to simply move to a flat rate, area-based model uh, and forget about historic, uh, uh, the, 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 the historical um, realities of payment, um, uh, that approach simply doesn't work for Ireland. Well, it may work for some people. But the net result will be that there will be a massive shift from the most productive sectors in agriculture in terms of supports 
to, to less productive sectors. And they're not less productive because the, predominantly because the farmers don't have the capacity to produce there, but generally because the land doesn't have the capacity to produce more food in those areas. Predominantly, but there are a whole series of reasons.